This is a one speaker meeting. Please welcome our, spe our speaker tonight, Larry. Hi, everybody. My name is Larry Thomas, and I'm an alcoholic. Larry. Hi, Larry. How you rat bastards doing? I, uh, <laughs> usually after the birthdays, you get a little uh, inspired. Tonight, we got horny. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm glad to be here. I want to uh, thank Rebecca uh, for, uh, for inviting me out to, oh, no, she don't want cake. She, she wants nuts. If you're new, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I, um, I want to thank the, uh, Alan for driving up here with me and Rebecca for having me come out here. Uh, my sponsor tells me that I'm living proof that a man can stay sober for close to 27 years and not amount to a damn thing. So uh, I don't know where you think you're going if you're new, but uh, the highest I've ever gotten here was sober, basic human being, active member of a home group. And uh, that's as high as I need to get. I, I sponsor some guys who have gotten higher than that, and they're totally useless to anybody, you know. <laughs> and uh, that one guy, Bobby, was talking to me before the meeting, and he said, uh, he had like, where is he? He had 10 days. He says, I feel like I'm in hell. And I said, well, you're close, uh, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> And it reminded me of that story of that, that guy that died and went to hell. And he's wandering around in hell, and he's got the long face, and he's all worried because he's in hell, you know. The devil comes up to him, and he says, hey, why the long face? And the guy says, well, I'm in hell. And he says, for God's sakes, did you ever drink before? And he says, yeah. And he says, well, you're going to love Mondays down here. We've got whiskey, we've got 151, we've got Old English, we've got Thunderbird. You don't have to worry about getting cirrhosis, hell, you're dead. And the guy goes, yeah. He says, did you ever do any dope? And he goes, well, a little. And he says, well, that's the kind of lion that got you down here. He says, you're going to love Tuesdays down here. We've got heroin, we've got crack, we've got hash, we've got weed. You don't have to worry about overdosing, hell, you're dead. <laughs> he says, did you ever gamble? And he goes, a little bit. And he says, you're going to love Wednesdays down here. <laughs> we've got the ponies. We've got poker. We've got slot machines. You don't have to worry about going broke. Hell, you're dead. <laughs> he says, do you like to smoke? And he goes, you betcha. And he says, well, you're going to love Thursdays. We've got Cuban cigars. We've got camels. We've got Salem's. We've got pipes. You don't have to worry about getting cancer. Hell, you're dead. He says, this is great. He says, are you gay? And he goes, no. And he says, well, you're going to hate Friday. <laughs> Rebecca told me to tell that one to you, the little pirate. So if you're new, you know, it's not what it seems, uh, you know. You may feel like you're in your final hour, you know. But I tell you, once you get about five or 10 or 15 years, you will look back on your first year and realize you were in your finest hour. You know, when Tony got done talking, and I could have listened to him all night. In fact, we damn near did, you know. And, uh, but when he was done talking, that is the formula. And the hardest thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is that its simplicity kills people. It can't be that simple. There's got to be a, a harder way to do this, and by golly, we're going to find out what it is, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's basically that simple, you know? I, uh, I come from a great home. I've got a great mom. I love her to death, you know? And uh, I was born in Detroit, and I come out to California when I was about three or four years old and brought up in a little foster home for a while, and my mom uh, finally found my dad, and we hooked up again, and uh, uh, my mom was a little Scandinavian lady, and uh, she loved diet pills. My mom was always buzzing around the house around midnight, you know, sorting out nuts and bolts all night, you know, or raking the neighbor's yard around 4 o'clock in the morning, you know. And, and uh, she loved to take that speed and needlepoint. 
Yeah, my mom would be clicking and clacking all night long, man, you know, and you can hear her because her house was small and she was just, just going to town, you know, and, and everything in the house had an Afghan on it, you know. <laughs> Couches had Afghans, chairs had Afghans, all my dad's golf clubs had little poodle heads, you know. Any animals, they had a fresh vest on, you know. Everything was tight and pink, just like mom, you know, and, uh, and just a busy lady. And no matter what time you got up, she was up doing shit, you know. I mean, just, just doing three or four different things. I didn't know it was my first tweaker I'd ever seen, you know. And, uh, and she was a busy lady, and, uh, and she had a lot of hobbies, you know, and uh, one of her favorite hobbies was to take that speed and, uh, and uh, make these big jigsaw puzzles, you know, these 30 million piece jigsaw puzzles, you know, <laughs> of the Mojave Desert or something like that, you know. <laughs> Gonna be a beige night tonight, you know. And she would uh, she'd take her prescription, run down to Savon's, get her a carton of Raleigh cigarettes, because they had coupons, and she saved these coupons to buy more yarn. It was a hideous cycle she was caught up in. <laughs> and she'd come home and take some more speed, plop open that big card table, put on her one and only moo she had for 50 years, you know. <laughs> Always wanted to stand in front of the window with that thing, you know, and... Uh, and she had this, uh, and she, she, you know, she'd take a couple more Dexies and start putting together this big puzzle, you know, and uh, she had a big pair of toenail clippers because if she got a piece that didn't fit, well, she'd snip that son of a bitch down, you know what I mean? <laughs> We're going to finish this thing tonight, you know, and uh, I tell you, I knew at an early age that my mom loved me, make no mistake about that, and she went out of her way to tell me and show me. And I tell you, that was going to set a pattern for me up until and after I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is, whenever anybody would show me any love or affection, I would play them like a fiddle. And there would never be a time too inconvenient, no matter what age or what part of my life I was in, there would never be a time too inconvenient for me not to put the tap on that lady. I never want to forget that. I never want to forget what it's like to be 19 years old and coming out of a place where I'd been put away for a small period of time. And on a cold April morning, I'm in a parking lot of a dry cleaners. And it's about 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's cold, and it's rainy out, and I'm in my little street mud, and my mom hadn't seen me for a while. And I'm in that parking lot, and she's about from here to that wall back there, and I'm just staring at her. And the only thought is, she better have a buck for me to walk through that rain go into that lady's place of business, startle her one more time, and ask for that dollar, almost demand it, for her to get out her little Woolworth wallet, and this picture of me falls out when I'm eight years old on a Little League team, and she fishes for that one dollar and then two dollars, and with her trembling hand, she gives it to me, and she says, what would it cost to get my son back for me to run off to Wilmington where I'm gonna die? Now, if you're new, you take the same man, and the reason that it's important to me is you take the same man who is so-called desperate and willing to go to any length and he's new in Alcoholics Anonymous and you put me in a room like this or any other room and you put the secretary of the meeting that same distance as me and my mom and that dry cleaners and I want to ask you something how come when my life depends on it and I'm willing to go to any length to relieve this merciless obsession how come I can't walk that same distance and ask that man for a job in a meeting but I can walk that distance and use my mom and everybody else time and time and time again. And I'm here to tell you, if you're new, that if my alcoholism doesn't kill me, my selfishness and my self-centeredness will. Make no mistake about that. And that's why it becomes so necessary for a man close to 27 years to be close to and active in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous and have commitments in that meeting because I will never get so sober that I can't get drunk again. But I can get so drunk that I can't make it back. And I never want to forget what it's like to stand at your doors and look into your windows and wonder, will I ever have a part of this thing? Will I ever be in the middle of anything? Most important, this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. Because that's where I was to spend my entire life, always on the outside looking in. No matter what stage it was in my life, I would never be a part of this thing called life. I'd always be watching life from the, from the, from the train station going by me, just trying to take a quick look in that thing.
knowing that I'll never be able to hop on for the ride, you know? And I never want to forget that. Now, my dad was a happy drunk. My dad was a happy, singing the blues, Nat King Cole, Bobby Darren drunk. My dad loved to drink and sneak into his own damn house. It was an amazing thing, you know? And, and that's an art. That's an alky art. There's nothing, you gotta learn to sneak in and out of those damn windows, man. That's a, that's a damn, requ it's a requirement for an alky, you know? And it's very important you know what window you're coming in and out of. The easiest window is the bathroom, but you never know when that toilet's right underneath your foot and break your neck, you know what I mean? But my dad was a refinery worker and he used to sneak into my bedroom and I can feel that big boot on my chest as he's coming in, you know? Grabbed that boot one night and I said, Dad, I said, you know, why don't you have Mom make you a set of keys? You know, my God, she's up anyway, you know, and uh, I can hear the Hoover going now, for God's sakes, you know. But my dad made drinking look, look good. His drinking didn't scare me. I knew the old man found fun when he was drinking. That guy was singing, and, and, and he used to use me as the butt of all of his jokes, and, and I used to love to be his, I used to love to hang around my dad when he was drunk, because I knew we were going places. And he used to take me to the bars and, and, and you know, and uh, do jokes with me, you know, like when I'm seven years old, it would be like Halloween, and he'd hollow out this pumpkin's head, stick it on my head, you know, <laughs> these little bastards would trick or treat, and he'd stick me in front of that door, you know, get the candy, Larry, and he'd just be cracking up, and I'd be in that little Halloween head, you know, <laughs> he'd just be busting a gut, and I knew my man, the old man found something, man, and I tell you, I spent my entire childhood seeking that man's approval. And I avoided my mom like the plague, but I wanted my dad's approval. And it took me uh, a couple years in Alcoholics Anonymous to find out why. And that was because I didn't have what it takes to be what he is. He made being a man so easy and just doing life so he was like a, a hero to me. But I started growing up and I started seeing things in that house and I got confused. And it seemed like the older I got, the more confused I got. I can do what every other kid is doing around the neighborhood, play and do all that stuff. But they seem to be getting a certain satisfaction out of everyday living. And I don't seem to get that complete satisfaction out of what these other, I need a little more attention than some kids. I don't need as much sleep. I, uh, I, I don't have attention to read. I, I'm, a, I'm a wanderer. You know, uh, my head likes to wander. There's a hunchback. Uh, I, what is it you want to do? Oh, oh, okay. She's the one that wanted it, not me. You know, you know. I'm just kidding. I'm just, Jesus. So all I know is that I did. All I know is that I've always had a busy head. I've had a head that's always told me I'm not worth a, a darn to anybody or anything, you know. I've got a head that always likes to chat. I've got the type of head that no matter how tired I am, my head loves to chat. I could be physically beat tonight, and around 3 o'clock in the morning, my head will just, hey, you in there? Let's chat. Let's talk about when you were a baby and bring you right up to date, for God's sake, you know. And, and the only thing frustrating about that is we just did it the night before, you know what I mean? <laughs> my head doesn't care, man. My head's got one job, and that is to get me loaded. That's its only job in life, man, you know? And I tell you, uh, at the age of 11 years old, I started drinking. I found a bottle of Four Rose whiskey. There was, about, there was about four of us, and we were in a garage, and we started passing around a bottle of Four Rose whiskey. And I tell you, I didn't head out to Skid Row that next day, you know, but... I got the address, <laughs> you know, but, but I found something in that first drunk that I would never find and recapture when I was sober. It put me in a place that I couldn't find when I was sober. No matter how good my life was, no matter what condition my life was, I would never find that place that I find when I am drunk. And that's the thing that drove me absolutely out of my mind, is that what started out to be a happy drunk turned into be one of these things that it was the only place that I could find peace of mind is when I was drunk. And the problem with the alcoholic of my type that once I'm sober, if I don't find that peace of mind again, I'm destined to return. You see, I'm the type of alcoholic that no matter how bad my last drunk is, it's never sufficient enough to keep me sober. And doing good in life doesn't make me feel good. 
doing, doing good in life doesn't make me feel good. And in fact, it seems to me that sobriety drives me to drink. And the longer I stay sober, the worse I feel. And coming to AA and watching people do wonderful things just makes me feel so damn miserable that I don't think I'm an alcoholic and maybe I don't fit in here. I'd come down to these meetings and see these guys with these ties on and they would say stuff like, 30 days ago, I was on the streets of Los Angeles. Now I'm the president of the Bank of America. Thank you. <laughs> Shit, I came in with that guy, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. All I know is that when I'm not drinking, I get so damn miserable that I can't focus on anything decent in my life. I've always got that little engine, man, that little thing that's, come on, let's go, drink, drink. That thing is just always, and I try to stay busy, and I've always got that little voice in me just hounding me all the time, you know? And uh, like I said, I had my first drunk at 11, and, uh, you know, uh, all my dad did is he didn't beat the hell out of me. All he did is lock up his liquor cabinet, put a big old lock on there, you know? And I started drinking at an early age, and by the time I got into high school, I was a freshman and other kids were going to their lockers to get their books and I was going to mine to take barbiturates to take off the shakes and the jitters. And by the time I was a freshman in high school, all my life I thought my, my problems was because I was Mexican. I took an inventory in Alcoholics Anonymous found out that I was just a white guy, you know. And I, <laughs> everything in me told me I was Mexican, man, you know. And, I'm a freshman in high school and I start dating this little Mexican girlfriend and, uh, and she introduces me to her brothers and uh, uh, I'm over in Torrance in La Rana by Gardena and, uh, and her brothers like cars, they like lowered cars, they like 62 Chevys down to the ground, you know. I used to get my hair up real big like a Bakersfield tumbleweed. I had these white t-shirts and black khaki pants that came up to here, you know. These women were telling me that men who are well endowed had big feet. I had a pair of 15 inch shoes, you know. I was driving around with my big hair and my big feet, wondering what the hell you're staring at. What are you looking at, you know? Driving around, listening to the Four Tops and the Temptations and Smokey Robinson, and God, I loved it, man. I was in my plumbing truck the other day, and the Four Tops come on, I just start sinking in my damn truck, man. <laughs> I loved it. I had a little Mexican girlfriend named Loopy. She curled up her head real big, you know, and we'd get our big hair and bounce around, you know, and had these three guys in the back, and everybody had names like they were from Disney. There was Poopy, Snoopy, Loopy, you know, Dogman, all these guys, you know, and we'd bounce around all night, man, and I loved life, man, driving into that damn jack-in-the-box restaurant, loaded up on that 151 rum. Rudy says, drive up and talk to the puppet. Well, I can't see the damn puppet, man. I drive up and that kid's yelling at me, can I have your order please? And I run over the damn puppet, the head's hanging down like that, you know, and I want him, I want him to be my designated driver, you know, and the, the cops come and they arrest me and they throw me on the hood of the car, they shatter my hair all over the place, you know, and I don't drive till I'm 30, big deal, let Rudy drive, he ain't doing nothing anyway, you know, and hell, he still ain't doing nothing for God's sake, you know, and and there's nothing like riding shotgun, man. You can drink all you want, and you just drive around, and you drink that Thunderbird, and you eat those reds, and you look in that mirror and realize how goddamn good-looking you are. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus, what are you doing in this? You shouldn't even hang around these Mexicans, for God's sake, you know? You ought to be an underwear model. Look at you, you know? And you got your hair all slanted over. You got cigarette butt stuck in it, you know? You got 50 pounds of puke on your chest, you know? And I feel like dancing when I look like that. I don't know about you. I'm about 110 pounds. I can't lick a stamp, you know? And uh, go down to the hideaway lounge. You go to the Leonardo's and looking for that salsa queen. And there she is, man. She's over by the bar and she's a little Latina and she's looking good, man. She's got her hair up in the air. She's got flies stuck in her hair, you know, there's eyelashes all over her face, you know, and man, you pick up that little hottie and you just dance all night and take her home and just live, live, man, wake up that next morning and take that 90-year-old woman back home, for God's sake, you know, but damn it, it was nice when it lasted, you know what I mean, who needs oxygen, honey, you know, I mean, I loved it, man, 
I loved it. I ran into a kid like that not too long ago. I was up at the Glendale Mall. This little kid comes walking by me. He's about 19 years old. He's all bald. He's tatted down. He's got a tank top on. He's got these big pants you could put about five guys in. He's got three phones because he's an important kid, you know. I walk by him. He's got his mom's earrings on. He's got a big hole in his ear. In case you lose him, you can hook that son of a bitch, you know. I, I think they ought to make rims for those ears. Spinners. Put some spinners in there, you know what I mean? I walk by him. He's got his big holes in his ears. He's got a hoop in his eye. He's got another ball bearing in his nose. He's got a hoop in his lip. Got a ball bearing in his tongue. Got a chain to his wallet. I walk by him. He goes, well, what the hell are you looking at? I says, I don't have a damn clue what I'm looking at, you know. I wanted to squirt him with some WD-40 just to keep him moving, you know what I mean? Well, we started laughing and talking for a little bit, and now I sponsor the guy, you know? Yeah. Lives down in Chula Vista, Ron, man. Ron was a crazy son of a gun, man. Called me up when he was new. What do you want me to do? And I said, well, geez, Ronnie. I said, why don't you unlock yourself, for God's sake, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I go to these meetings, and I feel so different. I says, really? I says, maybe it's because you're the only one wrapped up in a chain link fence, Ronnie. How about that, you know? <laughs> And you know, lo and behold, whenever you start sponsoring guys, you get these guys who have your defects of character times 10. You know what I mean? And besides being an alcoholic, one of my defects of character is I got a five inch belt of lazy ass that straps around here or I don't want to do a thing. I got to get paid to do my own chores around my house, you know? I wake up thinking about my nap, you know I mean? <laughs> Everything's about the nap, you know what I mean? Gotta have that nap, you know? When when can I take a nap, you know? Well, sure, crap, you know. I start talking to this kid after, and he's, a, he's in the Navy. No wonder, you know, and he wants to, he don't want to lift a finger for the rest of his life. And after about three months, I said, look at, you know, uh, you know, if I'm going to sponsor, you're going to be self-supporting, you know, and you got to get a little job, anything. And he him and he hawed. He finally called me up after about four months, and he was excited. Sponsor, sponsor, I finally got me a job, you know, and, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but he was excited. All right? Sponsor, I got me a job. You know, three times a week I go down to the sperm bank and, you know, and he's excited about this, you know? And I could just see this little guy, you know, every morning packing that lunch, you know, putting in those plastic gloves, you know, getting that Hustler magazine, heading out to work, you know. Gonna go to that hands-on job, you know, I mean, you know. He's doing good now. He, over in Utah, doing great, 10 years sober, good little fella. But that's the way I was, man. You know, always had something going on with me. I, I bounced off of those guys for a long time. I knew that me and Pooch and Loopy were gonna bounce off into the sunset, man. And you know that that damn near, I damn near died that way. I could not get rid of my images. I was so stuck in the street that I couldn't imagine life without my, I, I never want to forget what it's like to go to some of these detoxes, and that's why I love to go to panels and stuff like that. And this last panel I was on, just seemed to brought it home. I was over on Beacon Street, you know? And sure stuff, man, in the back row, 60-year-old guy with his Raider outfit on. And we laugh. But man, he don't know any other way. I didn't know that there was any other way. And I was just, I always had an image. I always had a little costume to put on. And when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 90 days sober and I got so afraid. I said to my sponsor, I said, I feel like I'm a phony. He said, no, 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 that ain't what happened. And he explained to me what happened. That all my life I've had an image to hide behind, whether it be a little low rider or a little loser or, or something. And I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and my head thinks I'm putting on another costume. It's a whole new vocabulary, whole new group of people, and my head thinks it's ready to play another act. And what you're really doing is you're getting ready to be yourself. And these clothes that we're putting on you, they're not costumes. These are things that you're going to fill out and be men and women. Alcoholics Anonymous took a 30-year-old man with a 10-year-old head and taught him how to be a man. 1969, I'm going, uh, some, some of my buddies are going to Vietnam, and, and I thought, well, maybe I would, you know, find my roots and go back to Detroit. And I wound up in Phoenix. And I'm over there in Phoenix off of North Central and Roosevelt. Um, $35 a month hotel, 
Everybody's got a TV, it's in the lobby. Everybody's got a restroom and it's down to, I spent my life in hotels. The first home I've ever gotten was about seven years ago. I don't know about staying. My life and my inventory just seem to be a series of fresh starts. I can start over like a son of a gun. And you know what? That's how a loser gets hope. I'm a loser. And that's the only way a loser gets hope. Losers don't hang in and work through. When it gets tough, they leave. And the only way they get hope is starting over and starting over. And I didn't know nothing about staying in and growing and hanging in. See, that's what my dad was made of. That's why I envied him. My dad had something called character. He's a wonderful man. I loved him to death. Anyway, I'm over in Phoenix, and uh, uh, i got to cut this short, but I, I start writing prescriptions over there. I start writing prescriptions and selling prescriptions for Secondol and Nembutol and Obitrol and Tulanol and you name it all. I wrote it all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Damn near took it all. And after about nine months, they caught up with me. And you know, when you're on barbiturates and, and whiskey, there's no freeway chase, you know? <laughs> there he goes down the 405, none of that's happening. It's just a matter of the sheriff coming into the proud parrot hotel going, there he is down there, you know? <laughs> well, anyway, they, uh, they arrested me and convicted me and put me away for a small period of time in southern Arizona. In 1975, they gave me a $45 voucher to come back to California and a register at the L.A. City Hall, and they s give me a little room in downtown Torrance, 1974, a little room at the Greyhound Hotel, and I'm two months without anything. I'm on antibuse, and I'm not drinking or using or anything, and I get a little job at a refinery. I'm going to be a laborer. And I don't get my license till I'm 32, so I'm taking buses everywhere. And I go to El Segundo, and I get off this bus to walk to work, and I wind up in a Little League field, and I'm in a dugout at about 10 o'clock in the morning, and I go absolutely out of my mind, stone cold sober, in between hysterical, maniacal. My paranoia is so bad that I'm hallucinating. And they take me to the Harbor General Hospital, and they diagnose that some of my drug overdoses have been suicide attempts, and that maybe I need to go to a state hospital to be observed for 30 to 60 days out by Oxnard. And a year later, they let me out, totally observed. <laughs> and they gave me my little antipsychotics and my little other things to take. And I'll tell you one thing about that medication. For every mental quirk I had, it seemed to work. But I'll tell you what doesn't work for me. I tell you what medication can't do to me, not even a bad drunk. And if you're new, this is a thing that makes me an alcoholic, that every time I'm not drinking, I have the ability to look over my 20, 25 years of drinking, and I can see everybody's face that I've hurt with all the remorse and guilt a man could hang himself with. I can see all the physical consequences of my body that's tearing up. I can see the, the consequences of jails and institutions. And you know what happens to me when I'm new? Every time I'm not drinking, for a short period of time, you know what happens to me? I come up with a profound conclusion that this time it's going to be different that this time it ain't going to get me. And even if I'm on medication, no matter what my living condition needs to be, it's never a sufficient force to keep me from drinking again. I used to think that if I hit the right bottom, that maybe that would keep me sober. Hell, I'm a bottom feeder. I hit a bottom and I just start setting up home down there, you know what I mean? And the memory of my last drunk is never sufficient enough to keep me sober for a long period of time. And I keep thinking that this time it's going to be different. And the memory of my last drunk is pushed away by the pain that I feel when I'm not drinking. And when I'm not drinking and I feel that much pain and insanity, I have to think that maybe this time it's going to be different because I'm sober now and it ain't worth a damn and I can't stand another day. But in 1965, there was a spot. In 1965, every time I drank, it opened up a big, beautiful window, and I stepped into this thing called peace of mind. And the problem with my life is the longer I drank, the smaller that window got, and the smaller that window got, and the smaller that window got. And by the time I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, there was no big, beautiful window. There was just this obsession that maybe someday, somehow, I can get that baby to work again. It's got to work, because I'm out of my mind now, and I'm sober. It's got to work again. And they can't medicate that away. 
That seems to be the difference between me and, and other problem drinkers. That's what makes me an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic and I can drink. Everything in me is faced that way. And all I can tell you is that when I came out of that, uh, that little hospital, that state hospital, I ran out of uh, Thorazine and after two months they found me up at Overo Street. Public drunk, public nuisance. They sent me up to Wayside again and after about 50 days they put about 60 of us in a black and white bus. Send me down to the South Bay Courthouse where I'm going to be sentenced to two and a half years in state penitentiary. I'm in a holding tank about this size and everybody's gone. Just concrete floor and, and bologna sandwiches. And I'm sitting on that concrete floor wondering where are they going to send me now? And at four o'clock in the afternoon, a Scottish man with a patch opened up a jail door and he says, are you Larry Thomas? And I said, yes, sir, I am. He said, come with me, son. We're going to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, my God, I says, uh, you know, what's, he said, we're going to AA. And I said, my God, what's AA? I've heard of OR and PO, but what's AA, you know? And, and who's the Scottish pirate, you know? <laughs> Rebecca's husband. I don't know who he is, you know? Hi, <laughs> lad. I had no idea that, I, that that was my first trusted servant. Now, why would that guy be a trusted servant? He had no business being there. He came there unsolicited. He wasn't on a panel. He wasn't a counselor. He wasn't a probation officer. He was a little refinery worker who got the worst news of his life, and that is his wife was dying immediately of a terminal disease. And he knew she was in good hands, but he knew he wasn't. But somewhere in his meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, somewhere in his book studies, Somewhere in his 12 and 12, somewhere in his discussion meetings, somewhere in his meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, it was quiet enough for him to listen to the sweet voice of a loving God and identify with what was going on in that room. And he grasped and developed this principle that says practical experience tells us that nothing will ensure immunity from drinking than intensive work with other alcoholics. That this works when other activities failed. And he turned his little car around and he talked to Judge Foy and Judge Hollingsworth and they said, I think we got a guy for you. And that man took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm ready for a long five hour drive up north and maybe some lunch. And he took me for a 15-minute car ride to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in that car, he told me the news that I was waiting to hear. He said, son, I know you've had a tough life and I know you feel different. By golly, he just nailed me. I've always been able to feel different and prove that I am, even in AA. That's that thing that always separating me from you no matter where I go. I'm always feeling different and I can't pin it on anything. He says, Larry, he says, I'm so glad we're going to AA. He says, in Alcoholics Anonymous, son, the more different you feel, the more qualified you are. <laughs> that nobody comes here happy and well-adjusted. <laughs> and he took me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he rolled up to this little, dingy, stinky Alano club. And I'd never seen that word before in my life. What the hell's an Alano? <laughs> Is it an animal? I've heard of eeks and, you know, eagles and moose and elks lodge, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, this is another animal, you know? Watch for crossing Alanos or what the hell they are, man. And rolled up to this Alano club and all these Alanos were running around and putting cups on the wall and they start coming, this little lady named Moose, he introduced me to all these goofy people, Indian Genie and Captain Bob and Singing Sam and Serenity Sam and Bicycle Ray and Santa Claus Ray and Dancing Pete and Whistling Butt and all these other people, you know. I just left a group of people like that. Little Moose come running after me. She goes, hi, honey, my name is Moose and I'm expecting a miracle. Well, I said, I bet you are. I said, I'm not it, you know. And, and then this big transvestite came out of the card room and he starts circling me like a helicopter in Norwalk, you know, and <laughs> he finally lands and he comes walking over and he says, hi, he says, I can't wait to take you to a candlelight meeting. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, not till I get a year anyway, for God's sake, you know. I said, my God, look at that guy's feet. They're huge, you know. And from 1975 to 1982, I came in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous on a regular basis, and that don't make me a worse alky or a better member. All that did is prove to me one important thing, that if I don't change, my sobriety date will. And I don't have the power to change. I am powerless. 
those first 40 pages in Alcoholics Anonymous, that more about alcoholism, all those chapters, they're not just telling you those stories so to keep you bored and go, they're telling you about not people's drunken escapades. If you read, they're tell, if you check it out, they're talking about powerlessness. They are talking to you to what we do when we have no power, that no matter what the situation is our life, we are destined to drink, even after being sober a while that we will never get so sober that we can't get drunk again. Because that man that brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous, his sponsor was up in Oregon with 46 years trying to get sober in a detox in Portland. And they asked him, what happened, Hap? You had so many years. And he says, I had a bunch of years, but I didn't have any days. And it's the days. We get so caught up in this nonsense around here that we forget that it's a day at a time. And nobody talks about living right now for right now. I was so caught up in coming from behind and got so, so into greed and, and wanting the good life that I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I got so sucked up in trying to get the material things. And to the untrained eye, when you come here, it looks like that's the solution. Because you sit here and you watch people and they don't drink, they get an apartment, they get a car, they get somebody to dance with, and to the untrained eye, it looks like the treatment for alcoholism is normal living, and nothing could be further from the truth. We've got people sitting in here right now in every other meeting who have every material instinct satisfied, and they seem to be a little bit restless, a little bit irritable, a little bit discontented, a little bit bothered by everything. Everything's a bother. Everything, you've got to come to these things, and the thing that was once a privilege is now a pain in the ass. I tell you, the solution to alcoholism for me has nothing to do with the material. It has to do with me and you and that book and the perpetuation of this gift, which is my primary purpose. And my sponsor told me a long, long time ago, son, you put all your efforts into staying sober and the rest of your life will take care of itself. But the more you start messing around with your personal life, the more restless and irritable and discontented you will become. His papa and Alcoholics Anonymous told him a long, long time ago, seek ye first the kingdom. Put all your efforts into staying sober, Larry, and the rest of your life will take care of itself. On May 2nd, 1982, it wasn't my worst drunk and it wasn't my longest one, but it was the one that drank up the bait. I found out what an alcoholic is, and that was me. Now I'm an alcoholic and I'm going to drink. And the only thing that keeps me from drinking is a fellowship called Alcoholics Anonymous and some principles that came about by working some steps in this thing and taking that long drive with that sponsor and telling them about the ghosts. Telling them about the memories. Telling them about the things that choked me out at night. Telling them about those things that didn't make me feel like a man. Telling them about those things that I should have done that I didn't and the things that I did do that I shouldn't have. Talk about how I nickeled and dimed people my entire life trying to cut corners and always to do things on the shortcut. Talking about always having my hand out and coming to Alcoholics Anonymous and one more time sitting in a room waiting for something to happen to me. And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, what you're waiting to be done to you, God is waiting to do through you. If you're new, be prepared to be divinely inconvenienced for the rest of your damn life, man. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous has nothing to do with your convenience. It's the longest thing I've ever done against my will my entire life, man. <laughs> I hope you come in here. I hope your life is at the point where you're willing to do something to, to um, you're willing to do the uncomfortable to get comfortable here. And by golly, you don't have to do it alone. The most magical thing we have in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's running thin, is called identification. One alcoholic talking to another so that we can live this way of life. I don't know much about God. I'm not a religious guy. I don't know nothing. You guys introduced me to a God of my understanding. And all I can tell you, what? Tonight in Culver City on a Wednesday night, I see row after row of people who should be dead, locked up, or insane. And look at us tonight. We're happy. We're joyous and we're free. Now, I don't have to see them. All I know is I've been playing in the evidence all night long. Thank you. Yeah.